than just believe this because I said to. We're going to get the behind the scenes. We're going to get deeper into the scriptures. We're going to go like outside the scriptures. We're going to talk about manuscripts. We're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about history. And we're going to talk about prophecy fulfillment. But So we're going to do an apologetics Bible study. Let's start, start off here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Come on, bro. Let's go, Kristen. First Peter chapter three. And we're going to pick it up. So this was written in the mid first century. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is after Jesus has died on the cross. He's resurrected. He's gone to heaven. And at this point, Christianity has been around for a little bit of time. And this is the message that Peter has for those in the first century. And he has for us today in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible reads, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And here in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes to anybody who would dare to proclaim Christianity. He tells them one thing. He says, above everything else, you, you need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope you profess. You know, I, I talked about this on a, a, a last, or earlier this week in a lesson. But as I, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I moved to San Francisco State when I was 20 years old. Moved to San Francisco. And after a year of sort of wandering, not doing any Bible, any church, I said, you know what? I need to get reconnected to God. I need to get back into the Bible. I started to go into a, a weekly Bible study that I didn't go to every week, but amen. Uh, it, was, it was every Monday, right? It was every Monday. And, and you know what? One Monday, I was walking to the study, and I saw some friends who I played basketball with coming, walking towards me at the quad at San Francisco State. And typically, I, I'd walk with my Bible out, with my Bible under my arm, and I was walking, I was walking to the Bible study, and I, as they got closer, I hid the Bible behind my back. I hid the Bible behind my back, and I said, what's up, guys? You know, said, what's up, tricked their hands, and then I continued to the Bible study. But what, a, it, 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 it was a sobering re, uh, understanding of to see where I was really at, and what really evaluating where I was at, it, it was that the end of the day this wasn't about truth to me this wasn't about worshiping god with all my heart this is what was about what i just felt worked for me right and when it boiled down to it if i would have talked to anybody from any other belief system i would not have been able to to explain why i believed what i believed it, it was because i my parents told me to it was because i had blind faith but the awesome thing about the Bible is that it is not built on blind faith. It is built on cold, hard facts and facts that we need to know to give a defense of what we're doing. Let's go to 1 Timothy, a few chapters earlier, a few books earlier. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll pick it up in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. It reads, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. See, here's the hope that God has for all mankind. It's not that everybody would just get magic fairy dust put on, on top of them and then they would just say, say you know, what? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to say a prayer. I, I'm going to believe that Jesus died for my sins. He says, no, no, no. My, my, my prayer, my hope is that everybody would come to a knowledge of the truth. Because here's the thing. The Bible is either true or it's not. That There's no in between. Here's the, thing. the Bible says it's 100% from God. 
The Bible tells us that, that there, there's not a fault in it. That each word is God breathed. That each word is perfect. So that's either true or it's not. Right? It, it's either the truth of the universe or it's not true at all. And, and the, what we got to understand is the cold, hard facts of it. Here's some truth for us. Here's some truth. The Bible was written for a period of over 1,500 years. From Genesis to Revelation, it, it, it spans a period of over 1,500 years. It was written in, in three different languages. Certain parts were written in Hebrew. Certain parts were written in Aramaic. And the majority of the New Testament was written in Greek. On, in three different languages on three different continents. Africa, Asia, and Europe. And the craziest part of all of it, in my eyes, is that it was written by over 40 different authors. There's over 40 different contributors to the, to the Holy Bible. And to give you a little perspective of how crazy that is, is that statistically speaking, for there to be over 40 different people who would completely agree on one topic that, that somehow all of their teachings would interweave from different classes, from different cultures, people speaking different languages. Here's the thing. There's people in the Old Testament who were kings, who ruled nations, who contributed to the Bible. And then going to the New Testament, there were fishermen, people who had no formal education, who contributed to the Bible. Yet from Genesis to Revelation, there's a seamless unity why is that it's because it is the true word of god but don't take my word for it let's get into it let's go to romans chapter one let's go to romans chapter one and here we're gonna we're gonna get into a bit of science we're gonna get into a bit of science in the Bible. And here in Romans chapter 1, Take me back in verse 18, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it reads, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And so here's a couple of things I want you to study. I'm not gonna get super deep, deep into it, but check out the, the cosmological constant the cosmological constant was something discovered by Einstein. And, and it, it talks about the, the, the incredible improbability of all of the universe coming together as it has. The it, it, cosmological constant, even tying into that would be gravity. How finely tuned gravity is. The fact that we're flying around a ball of, the, a ball of fire on an axis, the, the perfect distance from the sun, the perfect distance from the moon to get the perfect amount of heat, maybe a little extra heat here in Sacramento recently, amen, but the perfect amount of heat to sustain life, the, 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 the chances that everything would, would come together, it, it's more likely that a tornado go through a junkyard and out, out would come a 747 airplane then the chances are of everything in the universe just coming together by chance. You know, if you study out the laws of thermodynamics, right, one of the laws of thermodynamics is that it, without any external force, that disorder, to break it down simply, the disorder is natural. Order does not come from disorder. There's not one instance in the universe of order coming from disorder. What I mean by that is 
it, 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 there, there's, there's never, uh, uh, so think of your room, right? I, I'm sure everybody on this call is in an impeccably clean room right now. But let's say hypothetically you did not, right? If you have a dirty room right now, and you, 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 you're like, you know, I, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to put the clothes away. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my stuff away. The shirt that I was going to wear that I didn't wear, and then that jacket I was going to wear through on the ground. I'm going to get put that away. That what, what, what is what people are saying by saying that the Big Bang happened because a ton of particles were just it, throughout the air, and then somehow they just came together. It, it, what that's saying, and that order would have come from that, is saying is the exact same thing as saying that you would just randomly come into your room tomorrow and everything would be put in order. That the room would be vacuumed, that the clothes would be put away, that your bed would be made, that your pillows would be puffed up. That that is more likely to have the, the order we have in the universe today. And what Romans says here, what, the, what Paul writes, is that because of the beauty of the universe, because we can see a, a, a sea turtle, running into the ocean you know Devin and i last year on our honeymoon we were able to go down to the beach and, and allow baby sea turtles to run out of our hands into the ocean right and it, it, it's so cool you, you see these little sea turtles and they go into the ocean and they, they go off into the waves and and what what the bible what, what paul is writing here is that because we can see we we, we can see a, a a killer whale in the ocean because we can see the the beauty of the waves we can see a sunset we can see that, that the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different types of fish in the ocean, because of the, the thousands of different types of dogs, and because of all of the beauty of mankind. God says, because of all of the beauty of creation, people are without excuse. God's, God's telling us that you can't look at the universe, you can't look at the world, look at nature, and say that there wasn't a creator. That's Paul's point here. He says, you, 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 when you look at the universe, when you look at God's creation, you are without excuse not to have some sort of faith in a creator. Let's keep going. Let's go to Job chapter 26. Job chapter 26. Let's go, bro. Come on, Christian. And in Job chapter 26, many scholars believe that the book of Job was actually the oldest writings in all of in all of creation that this is the, the, the first writings that we have a record of it's kind of crazy but here in job if you look at job chapter 26 check this out I, again i look into science here job chapter 26 and we'll pick it up in verse 7. This is Job speaking of God. He says, He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. We'll stop right there. And so here's the thing. Here Job writes, he says, Hey, you know, you know uh, uh, he suspends the earth over empty space. The northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. We, you look at this today. And we, we think of the earth being suspended over nothing. What is that? Oh, it, oh well, of course, you know, it's gravity, centripetal force. It's the idea of, uh, of the earth. We're, we're in the middle of outer space, spinning hundreds, thousands of miles per hour around a ball of fire. But what keeps us, of, of course, it's gravity. And, you know, we have, we have all of it. We have the planets around us. And, and for us in 2020, it, it, it seems like second nature. Of course, that would happen. Of course, that, that, that's obvious. The thing is, that as gravity is mentioned here, thousands of years before even Jesus Christ was born, gravity is mentioned when gra gravity was not discovered scientifically until 1687 by Isaac Newton. Yet here, Job writes about God suspending the earth over nothing. He, 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 he mentions gravity. And in, in one chapter of over 40 chapters of writing, over 40 chapters of writing, yet in one verse, he mentions gravity, not as, not as a main point, but as, as a support to who God is, he's, he mentions gravity. How, we have to ask ourselves, how could somebody who have thousands of years ago be able to mention gravity 
something to keep in mind as we continue this Bible study. Let's keep going. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Come on, Christian. And in Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to pick it up in verse 22. It reads, he sits enthroned, again, speaking of God, this is written 750, the book of Isaiah written 750 BC. It says, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. And so here, 750 BC, Isaiah writes that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Now what's interesting, and something that I learned from our dear brother Yusuf Yunin in uh, Silicon Valley, who's, who, who can read Hebrew and can actually read and speak Aramaic, um, he, 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 so he could read the original text that this is written, which is pretty cool. But what he, what he tell, told me and explained to me is that the word here, circle, the word circle of the earth, there's no term for circle in Hebrew, right? There's no term for circle. The word circle means sphere, right? So if someone were to, to explain this in Hebrew, they'd say it's a circle because the word circle means sphere. They're synonymous. And so what this is telling us here in Isaiah chapter 40 Isaiah writes that God sits enthroned above the sphere of the earth. Now, something that's crazy about the sphere of the earth is that it wasn't until recently that scientifically people even knew that the earth was a sphere. For thousands of years, even after Jesus Christ, even the Catholic Church for many years taught that the earth was flat. Right? Taught that the earth, there's even so people today that still think the earth is flat. But now, by the grace of God, we have NASA, we have satellites to show that the earth is a sphere. But back then, they didn't have satellites. They didn't have telescopes. They had no intel into the, the shape of the globe. Yet here, Isaiah mentions in passing, in one verse of his 66 chapters, that God sits enthroned above the sphere of the earth. Let's keep going. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. Let's go 15 chapters later. Let's get another prophecy from Isaiah. Come on, bro. And in Isaiah chapter 55, again, Isaiah was somebody who was a scribe. He didn't have any crazy education. He wasn't a scientist. He had no great, great scientific discoveries or uh, uh, a claim, claims to fame or anything like that in the secular world. Yet here he writes 15 chapters later in Isaiah chapter 55 in verse, verse 8. It reads, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And here, Isaiah writes, he's speaking of, of, of the grandness and the incredible size of God. He says, he says you know, God looks down on us. He, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You can't look, think, look, think of how you see the world and then think, okay, well, how would God see this? It, it, it's not even worth trying. It's like teaching a two-year-old Calc 3, right? It, it's not even worth putting any breath into. And the crazy part is that a three-year-old or a two-year-old is, is closer to understanding Calc 3 than we are to interpreting God's thoughts, to put that little perspective in our heads. But here, Isaiah says, you know what? Don't even try to understand God's thoughts or God's ways, but he, he says, okay, what's, and here he uses an illustration. He says, okay, as the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. 
And then what he says, he says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it w- without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that you'll seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. So here, Isaiah gives a prophecy. He says, hey, as, God, as the rain and snow come down from heaven, they don't return to it the earth bud and flourish what do we call that the, the, the rain and the snow coming down and then returning to the sky we would call that the water cycle and here in isaiah 55 written in 750 bc isaiah prophesies about the water cycle something that wasn't discovered until the 16th century by bernard bernard palissy in the 16th century a, a, a scientist proved the water cycle. He discovered the water cycle. Yet, and they, there was a big celebration. He was a celebrated scientist. Yet over 2,000 years earlier, Isaiah had written about the water cycle. How is it? How is this possible that the, the science from Job to Isaiah, and it doesn't stop there. Go to, for, go to the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see Paul writes, Paul, Paul writes about even more science. It wasn't, just the, it wasn't just the prophets from the Old Testament. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, to give you some perspective, it wasn't until the 19th century that, that telescopes became any more than a, a, a more powerful than a, than a magnifying glass you could it wasn't until recent, well, the last 300 years that telescopes became any more than a magnifying glass you could buy at the dollar store. So keeping that in mind, and here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 40, excuse me, we'll start in verse 40. It says, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, The moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. And here, Paul writes, he's talking about heavenly bodies. So he's talking about bodies that would be outside the, the atmosphere, outside in outer space. He says, hey, the heavenly bodies are one type. The earthly bodies are another. But he says, hey, you know what? The, the sun has one type of splendor, right? That the sun is unique. The moon is unique as well. The moon has, has, their, has its splendor. The stars have theirs. But then he says, star differs from star. Making, making the declaration that each single star is unique. Each different star is unique. Yet when was this discovered? It wasn't until 18... 18- 31, 1831, that it was discovered that each star was unique. Again, we, we look at all of these prophecies from, from Job. We look to, to, to Isaiah, to 1 Corinthians. All the way back, we'll look at one more before we get into the history. Go to Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, we see yet another prophecy, yet another, another scientific prophecy that wasn't discovered until the last 100 years. This was discovered in the last 100 years. In Genesis chapter 17, and read in Genesis chapter 17, and here God is giving Abraham the commands of how to lead his people. He's giving Abraham the commands of how to govern and the standard to call his people too. And you pick it up in Genesis chapter 17, verse nine, it says, then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you for the generations to come. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner those who are not your offspring. And so here, it's a very particular command, right? God says, hey, all the males, you you must circumcise them if if they're going to be men of God. 
and we read and it says when they're eight days old right for for thousands of years scholars read this and had no no understanding of what it meant eight days old but it's in the bible so so even over over the last thousands of years this is a practice that's been practiced on the eighth day on many countries around the world even today right i i know specifically there there's specific countries in africa who still do this on the eighth day they circumcise their males and for the thousands of years people said man like what it's such a random command of god right but in 1935 professor h dam discovered that after a child is born they they have a certain level of vitamin k and prothrombin in their blood it's they have blood clotting agents in their blood when a baby is eight days old he discovered they spike to the highest levels they'll be for the rest of their life for one day babies have a, a the highest level of blood clotting agents in their blood when they're eight days old in 1935 less than 100 years ago proving the best day of your life to get cut, to get scratched, to get circumcised, it was when you're eight days old as a human being. Yet here was prophesied all the way back in the time of Genesis. Let's look at a scripture that pulls all of these prophecies together in First Peter, Second Peter chapter one. In Second Peter chapter one, as we start to turn the corner here in the apologetic study tonight, in Second Peter chapter one. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, we may ask, how, how is it that, that all these different people, all these different authors were able to precisely name all of these prophecies, all the science checks out, verified thousands of, thousands of years later? How is it? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, above all. So here Peter writes, he says, hey, above all, above everything else I'm talking about. You must understand that no prophecy of scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And here, what's, what's the answer? How is it that all of these people were, were able to prophesy, were able to talk about these scientific, monumental scientific discoveries thousands of years? before they were discovered it's because these guys weren't speaking from themselves they were speaking the words of god but you know what some people science you may say you know what that's science i'm not a big science guy you know i, I i'm into uh i'm into other stuff you know i'm into uh i'm more of a prophecy fulfillment guy you know you, you talk to me about history right you talk to me about something that happened thousands of years that was spoken about thousands of years ago a, a world event that happened that's going to get my attention we, we have that section for you too let's go to isaiah chapter 44. isaiah chapter 44. and in isaiah 44 again isaiah back at it again here and in isaiah chapter 44 this is a prophecy right and i'll break it down after i read this opening passage and we're going to look at some prophecy fulfillment here. And in Isaiah chapter 44, we're going to pick it up in verse 24. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited. Of, it, of the towns of Judah, they shall be built. Of their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the water, watery deep, might be dry and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will save Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundation be laid. And here we see a, a prophecy. This was in, again, 750 BC, this is recorded. 
And what's, what's recorded here is a prophecy of, as you'll notice, the, the name here, King Cyrus, right? So if you look at verse 28, it says, God will say, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundation be laid. So the interesting thing about this prophecy, right, is that King Cyrus, who's mentioned here, as even it continues in chapter 45, as we read the first few verses, this is what the Lord says to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor and to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And here, God's prophecy says, hey, Cyrus, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you to subdue the nations, to strip kings of their armor. And as he says, to, to preface all of that, he says, Who, I'm, I'm going to use Cyrus to say of the city of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. Let it be rebuilt in verse, chapter 44, verse 28. And somebody would read this and say, okay, cool. So in 750, it talks about Cyrus is going to be used to rebuild a city. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Here's the interesting thing. Isaiah here was a scribe. He was a Jewish scribe under Babylonian rule, right? So this, this guy, would, would, nobody cared about him, right? Nobody in authority, no, no, no king, no prince had, had, had any, any care to, to, to know what Isaiah was writing about or what Isaiah thought. But here Isaiah prophesies, he says, hey, Cyrus is going to set the captives free. Cyrus is going to have the city be rebuilt. The thing about Cyrus here is that historically we know that he wasn't born for another 100 years. When Isaiah wrote this prophecy down, Isaiah, or Cyrus had not even been born. The crazier part even than that is that the city of Jerusalem hadn't been burnt down. The city of Jerusalem was, was still a prominent city was still a city with walls, was still a city with a temple. And here a prophecy in Isaiah 44 says that Cyrus is going to have the city rebuilt. So for 100 years, about 100 years, people think Isaiah is crazy. People think Isaiah is crazy until what happens in Ezra. one. It's back in the Bible, but it's forward over 100 years in real life. But it's behind, behind uh, Isaiah in the Bible. Back in Ezra, chapter 1. And in Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll pick it up here, chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So here... In the first year of his reign, Cyrus raises up, and this is a historical figure. You can Google him. Cyrus raises up in his first year as rule. Josephus, a, a prominent a historical Jewish philosopher, writes that, that uh, Cyrus was shown the prophecy of Isaiah. He was shown what he wrote, was written about him by name over 100 years before he was born. And it moved his heart so much that he sent the Jewish people back 
to rebuild the city. To give you an understanding of how crazy this is, this was the most powerful man in the world and the Jewish people were, were just his slaves. And he says, you know what? Whoever wants to go back, I'm gonna relieve, relieve you of your duties. And not only that, you can take all the gold and the silver and the livestock that you need. And this was, this was, this was prophesied about, it was fulfilled. And the coolest part is that we still have the prophecy with us today. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. The Cyrus Cylinder, it's in a museum in London. And I had the privilege of in 2016 going to see it. And what it is, it's a prophecy. They didn't have billboards back then. They didn't have uh, uh, screens. They didn't have anything to put up. So what they would do, they take cylinders and put a proclamation in the middle, in the, in the square in the city to allow people walking by to come and read it. And what, what this said, if you, you can even Google the, what the prophecy says, and it's to send the people back to rebuild their city. It's so awesome that it, it's a tangible piece of evidence we still have in the 21st century. But as it doesn't stop there, you think, man, Silas, Cyrus Cylinder, that's insane. That's, that's mind boggling. Oh my gosh, bro. Like that's enough right there. That's enough for me to have faith. But let's say that it's not right. Let's say that it's not. Let's go to Daniel chapter eight. Let's go to Daniel chapter eight. Daniel chapter eight. And you know, a lot of people say, you know what? The Bible, yeah, Daniel, all this stuff, you know, I, 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 I'm hearing what you're saying, but, you know, this is rewritten. This stuff, you know, Isaiah, Daniel, I mean, this stuff has been rewritten. It wasn't written in English. This stuff was actually, you know, as you said, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. Here's the thing. The New Testament alone is the most validated, validated ancient document that we have in antiquity today. Meaning that the most validated manuscripts we have in all of the world. More, more validated than the writings of Homer, of the Odyssey, uh, of, of Plato, of Aristotle. More validated than all of their writings is the New Testament. There's over 5,000 early dated manuscripts of the Bible, right? There's even, if you look up, Google the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Scrolls that, that there are prophecies about Jesus and the manuscripts have been carbon dated to hundreds of years before Jesus was born, prophecies about him, right? So, so check that out. Another fun fact here that we'll get into is about Jesus and that Jesus is a, a more validated ancient figure. If you throw out everything in the Bible, you throw out everything, every manuscript, you burn every manuscript of the New Testament, the Old Testament, all of Jesus's teachings, you, you burn all of those, there's more external evidence of Jesus's life than there is Julius Caesar. There, there's more writings of Jesus Christ than one of those prominent ancient figures we have. But people still question him. Why? Because of the power of the message that he brought. Because if you could say, hey, I, I'm not sure if it's, if, it's, if it's actually the right thing to do. I'm not sure if he was even real. It gives people some wiggle room in their conscience not to obey. But let's keep going here. Let's go to <clears throat> Daniel chapter 8. Let's go, bro. And here, the, the awesome story, I mean, some of you guys may know the, uh, the story of Daniel. And uh, he, he's well known for uh, his time in the lion's den, as a lot of you guys may have learned in, uh, uh, um, in Sunday school. But he's much more than a, a story about a Sunday school, uh, Sunday school uh, lesson. He's a much deeper figure than that. And Daniel 2 is an incredible prophecy. All right. In Daniel 2, there's a prophecy of, uh, uh, of many kingdoms that are going to rule the world. And I encourage you, those who are visiting, get into a Bible study. And you'll get deeper into Daniel chapter 2, which is an incredible prophecy in itself, talking about the, the empires that are going to rule over the next thousand years thousand years in the future from when this was written. But in Daniel chapter eight, I want to talk about a little bit of a more specific prophecy. And so in Daniel chapter eight, this is a prophecy of 
Alexander the Great, right? This is a, a prophecy of Alexander the Great and the kingdoms that would come. And so we pick it up in Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. It says, in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that has already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the providence of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So here, what's interesting of note, it says of the ram charging, it says that he became great. Right? So we'll take a footnote of that. But let's continue. It says, verse 5, it says, As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him and and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. So here we read this, and now we're going to break it down a bit. So, so we're seeing this sort of crazy story here, right? There's a ram, there's a goat. The ram has two horns. The goat has one prominent horn. They're coming against each other. They're running into each other. The, the ram's getting taken down by the goat. All this crazy stuff. So, so here's the cool thing is that the, the, the ram and the goat, it, it's not just artistic interpretation, what they represent. It actually explains it, right? Jump down. Jump down to verse, <clears throat> to verse 18. It says in verse 18, it says, while he was still sleeping, sleeping, while he was still speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Now, hundreds of years after this was written, the kings of Media and Persia became the greatest world powers, the most powerful two kingdoms in the world. And here it's prophesied, hey, the kings of Media and Persia will take the lead. Verse 21, the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king the four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power so historically the babylonians become a great empire during the time of daniel the babylonians are 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 the are ruling the world after the babylonians the medes and the persians come to power That's where Cyrus the Great stepped in, right? The Medes and the Persians came to power. But as the Medes and the Persians were were ruling the world, a shaggy goat, it says, it says that the the, the large horn between his eyes is the first king. A shaggy goat, the first horn was was Alexander the Great. What's significant is that Alexander the Great was the first king of Greece. Before Alexander the Great, there wasn't a king. If any of you have seen 300, the movie 300, the reason that there's the movie 300 is because they didn't have a king who had the power to say, hey, our empire is going to war. They were split up into different tribes. And hundreds of years after that movie of 300, that time where they they go against Xerxes, who was a biblical historical figure as well, years after that, Alexander the Great steps up and unites all of the tribes of Greece. 
becoming the first king hundreds of years after the prophecy here in Daniel. But here's the thing. Alexander the Great rose to power and he became the most powerful man in the world. They, they, Greece ruled the whole world and, and they got everybody speaking Greek. Greek was the English of the first century. Why? Because Alexander the Great got everybody speaking Greek. But when Alexander the Great was 33 years old, he was poisoned. He was poisoned. And his famous last words, his four generals came to him and they said, Alexander, who, who is, is, is the kingdom going to go to? Who, are you, who is your heir? And his famous last words, he said, to the strongest. And from there, the four, the four uh, uh, kings said, oh, bet, that's me right here. I, I'm, I'm stepping up. And the, the, four, the four generals stepped in their, they took over their respective tribes and they did not remain united. As it says in verse 22, the four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. The, the Greek empire was destroyed, was disintegrated, and then the Romans came and brought them back together. All of this prophesied 550 BC in the time of Daniel. And so here, there's so much prophecy in Daniel that I'd love if you're visiting to get into a Bible study later, but we're going to stop there. Now we're going to look at a prophecy of Jesus Christ, right? Look at prophecies of, of history, of science. Let's look at a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Psalm chapter 22. So the book of Psalms was written 1000 BC. All right. So the, the book of Psalms was written 1000 years before Jesus was born. And we pick it up in Psalm chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22. And if you look here in Psalm chapter 22, verse 15, excuse me, verse 14, this is a, a, a prophecy here about Jesus Christ. It says, I, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax and has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a posture and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And here, you show this scripture to anybody. You show the scripture. Now, I'm not even talking about somebody who's religious. You show this, this scripture to almost anybody who you know. And you say, hey, who's this talking about? They'll say, Jesus Christ. I mean, it talks about Pierce. It talks about, uh, uh, it talks about the uh, casting lots for the garments. It talks about all his bone, bones are out of joint. It, it, it's a clear prophecy of Jesus Christ. Yet it was written 1,000 years before Jesus was born. And here, not only was, is there one prophecy, there's over 50 detailed prophecies about Jesus Christ. Let's look at one more, a specific fulfillment of this one. If you look at verse 18, it says, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. A very specific prophecy that lots would be cast for his clothes. It's not something you hear about every day, but let's see the fulfillment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Come on, Christian. Come on, Christian. Let's go, Christian. And Matthew, Matthew here, Matthew chapter 27, this is the, 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 uh, the, the account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it says here in chapter 27, verse 32, it says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
And so here, a prophecy of Jesus' crucifixion. And what does it say happened at his crucifixion? They divided his clothes by casting lots. And the, the crazy thing about Jesus' crucifixion is that this, 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 these letters from the New Testament, this isn't something that was put in a seal for 2,000 years and then we opened it up 20 years ago here. This, was, this stuff was in circulation. This stuff was in circulation. So if anything in the New Testament could have been shot down without a doubt, there's zero chance it would have made it 2,000 years later and the prominence and the dignity that it has reached us in, right? And that's the last thing I want to talk about to you guys is circumstantial and eyewitness evidence. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's 2 go, Peter, as we quote, look at these last few scriptures here. Take him back to school, you know. Come on, Christian. Loving it. 2 Peter chapter 1. And here, this is, you know, what's interesting about circumstantial evidence, about eyewitness testimony, is that this is stuff that the accounts of, of the apostles, the accounts of the disciples from the first century, this wasn't just, just something they got together and talked about and said they were going to, hey, we're going we're gonna to stick with this story. We're, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, the 12 of us are gonna get together and we're, we're, we're gonna band arms and no matter what happens to us, we're gonna hold on to this account, right? And here's why I want to explain to you and convince you that this couldn't have been just an elaborate scheme. Because let's look here in 2 Peter chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 16, it says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We'll stop right there. Here, here Peter writes, and here's the thing. People were questioning them, the Christians in the first century, in the same way they're questioning us today. They, they, they were saying, this didn't really happen. You, you, guys, you guys are making this up. You, you guys, Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. And Peter's saying, hey, hey we're not, this isn't a, a testimony we're just talking about. We were eyewitnesses. We saw Jesus Christ die on a cross Physically die on the cross, get buried, and rise again three days later. And here's the, so the, 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 maybe the best evidence of that is that when Jesus got arrested and was taken to the cross, Jesus was, we all know about the Last Supper, right? Jesus was, was with all his 12 apostles. We, we, we've seen all the pictures. We've seen all the stories. We've seen all the memes. Jesus at the Last Supper, right? But, but here's the thing. Jesus, all of Jesus' apostles said, Jesus, I'm never going to leave you. I, th there's nothing that could ever allow me to leave you. Until what happened? Until they were actually tested. They came to, the, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. What happened? All of his apostles fled. Why? Showing us that, that blind faith for them wasn't enough. They had faith. They'd even seen miracles. But the faith in what Jesus had done wasn't enough for them. Because when, when the rubber really met the road, abandoned Jesus. And this is when they were, they were physically with him, right? Man, so think about it like this. Is it, when, when is it easier to, to tell a friend you don't want to hang out with them? When you're standing right next to him, hey, I don't really want to hang out with you right now. I'm going to go home. Or is it easier to say when you're, when you're 30 miles away or 50 miles away, hey, you know what? I got stuff going on and, and I can't just hang out right here, right now, right? It's much easier when, when you're at a distance. For them to deny Jesus when they were side by side with him, it, it, it is, is such a disgraced feeling. And if you look at the account of the apostles, they were all disgraced. They all felt terrible about it. What was the difference between the apostles before the crucifixion and the apostles after who each and every one of them was killed for their belief? 
outside of Judas who, Judas who hung himself and outside of John who was boiled alive but survived. All of the other 11 were killed, hung upside down, uh, uh, beheaded, stoned to death, bru- skinned alive, brutal deaths all over the world. From Rome to India to, to, to Europe to, to, uh, to each, each Africa, to each part of the world, all of these apostles were killed for what they believed. What changed? It was that they actually saw Jesus Christ rise from the dead. What's a good scripture to support that? Go to First, First Timothy chapter 15 as we start to close out. First Timothy, or excuse me, First, Corinth, First Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, again, these were letters. So for those of us who are visiting, the, the, the epistles, so the majority of the New Testament, these weren't just sort of locked up in a safe. These were letters that were circulated all around the world in the first century. And there's copies and thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of copies of, of people who would write down the manuscript, write down the manuscript, more validation because there's so many manuscripts and they all fit together. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we pick it up in verse, verse 3. This is Paul writing. It says, For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, to one abnormally born. So here's the thing. Paul writes that not only did he appear to the the comrades, the, the, the 12 apostles, it says he appeared to more than 500 men and women. So here's the thing. If I say, that uh, our dear brother Kang, who, who led some awesome songs to start off this devotional. If I said, oh my gosh, like I saw Kang, he, he died for two hours and then he resurrected. I, I mean, I, I swear, I checked his post, he was, he was physically dead. Actually, did I say two hours? I meant two days. He was, he was dead for two days and then he resurrected. And you know, I get all the guys in his household to, to validate it. We saw it too. We, we saw it, Kang was dead for two days. Here's the, here's the thing. That's, it's, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. So, so here's the thing. If we get 5 or 6 or 10, 15, even 20 people to, to validate a resurrection, we're, we're not getting CNN knocking on our door, right? It's just people, some friends and family think we're kind of crazy. But when you get 500, 500 different people from different walks of life, to validate this, that it wasn't just the 12, it was more than 500. It, it, it shows that this wasn't just an illusion. This wasn't just a conspiracy. This was real life. That Jesus died and resurrected on the third day. Because if, if it had not happened, if it had not happened, then this, this letter that would have been circulated in the city, circulated in the city of Corinth, the city of Rome, the city of Ephesus, all throughout the modern world in the first century, it would have been crumpled up if there was nobody to validate the claims. But because it checked out, checked out, checked out, checked out, here we are in 2020, almost exactly 2,000 years later, still talking about the same claims. Why? Because they weren't just claims of some sort of crazy conspiracy. They were claims of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Let's start to close out here. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Let's go, bro. Because a lot of people say, you know what? Okay, well, the Bible, it it was put together by a lot of people who were just super fired up to have a Savior, right? They were were super fired up and, you know, they, but but here's the cool thing about this, the, the gospel of Luke, right? Luke was a doctor. Right, Luke was the doctor. Luke, Luke wasn't somebody um, who was with Jesus from the, from the get go. Right, Luke, Luke wasn't somebody. So what did what did Luke do? He didn't give an account of his experience. He didn't give an account of you know what Jesus. I, I spent 
I spent three years walking with Jesus. This is what happened, man. You would not believe what he did when the 5,000 people showed up. That's not Luke's account. Look what Luke did. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you, you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So here's what Luke did. Luke didn't have any access to the writings of, of Matthew, of Mark, of any of, of the apostles. He didn't, he didn't have access. But what did, he, what did he do? He went and he talked to different people. He, because he wanted to be objective, right? This guy wasn't going on Wikipedia, copy and paste in his book report. This guy's like, you know what? I, I, I understand the weight of what this is. If, if, if this is really God, if, if this is really the calling for all mankind, I've got to make it my life mission to make sure that I confirm or deny these reports. And you know what? As Luke put together his account and you hold it up to Matthew, Mark, and John, there's not one contradiction. There's not one contradiction, right? It, it, it's, 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 it's you going to, a, uh, it's you going to a, um, a basketball game to watch a basketball game and a friend said, oh, you know what? I was there too. And then another guy says, yeah, no, I was, I was there. So two guys, they, they, they both say they were there. You know what happened. I'll tell you guys what happened. Um, well, you know, the one, team, uh, the one team scored a lot of points. The other team didn't score as many, but they scored some. And the white, black, white, the white team won. Right? Right? It's like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But then, then the other guy says, oh, you know what? No, I, I uh, you know, the, the, the white team got out to a 10-0 lead. And then the black team bought, fought back. They hit four three pointers in a row. They went up to by they won it by six. And then you know the black team ended up winning on a buzzer beater by three points. They hit a three pointer at the end. It's like that guy was there. And here Luke, he, he's like, you know, I, I, I'm not just going to take people's word for it. I'm going to go talk to all different types of people who were at the game to see who's telling the true story. And Luke went through person by person by person by person to put together an account. And his is an, a, a historical account of Jesus's ministry. You know what, let's start to close out. We're gonna look at two scriptures here to end. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter four. And then we're gonna close out in the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter four. Because we, you, you look at all this stuff, and for those of us who are visiting, you may, even some of the, the, those in the church tonight, you may see if there's this much evidence, there's over 50 detailed prophecies, there's over 50,000 manuscripts, there's, it's the most validated ancient document. Jesus is the most validated ancient figure we have in the universe. How is it that there, there's so many people still questioning it? Millions and millions and millions, billions, billions of people still questioning. How is that? How, 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 how that doesn't connect. And in a practical sense, it does not connect. But here's the thing. We don't live in a practical world. We live in a spiritual world. And let's look at that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, our gospel, the gospel is the good news. Even if the good news is veiled, is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot. It doesn't say that they will not. They cannot. They cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And here's the reality that we live in is that we live in a spiritual world where, where Satan has veiled the minds. He hasn't veiled the eyes. 
he's veiled the minds of unbelievers to the point where, where even, even many of us, before we became disciples, or for those of us who are visiting throughout your time, you, you read the Bible, but there's some sort of veil. You read it, it, it doesn't directly, it, it's, it's impactful, but it doesn't cause any revolution in your life. You see it, but you, you ask yourself, why is this not affecting the world how it should be? Why, why, do I, why are people at my church not doing this? Why, why does everybody take this so lightly when the scriptures seem to be so cut and dry? It's because Satan's blinded the minds of unbelievers. The question then becomes, how do we get out of that fog? You know what? I don't want to be that fog, Christian. I, I, I believe you. I believe you that there, there's a fog. I, I've been in a fog. I haven't really been able to connect to the scriptures my whole life. I want to change. I want to see a difference in my life. I want to see God move. I want to see God change the world. I want to see the Bible be fulfilled. There's a challenge for you. It's in Psalm chapter 119. Let's go. It's a straight heat, Christian. Psalm chapter 119. And in Psalm chapter 119, verse 1, the Bible reads, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their hearts. What's missing in the, in the religious world today? It, it's not men and will, women who are willing to call the Bible God's word. It's not men and women who are, who are, who are willing to call themselves Christian. It's, it's men and women who are unwilling to make God's word their standard. That's what's missing. It, what, what's missing is that we, we don't see those today who are really willing to seek God with all their heart. But I believe that every single one of us on this call tonight is here because God has ordained you to be here. If you're in Sacramento, if you're across the country, if you're in, a, if you're, if you're in another state, if you're in another, another country, it doesn't matter. You're another zip code. I, I can full heartedly with, with, with a clear conscience say that you're here because God has ordained you to be here. Why? Because he want, he's calling you to seek him with all of your heart. And here it says, blessed are they. Blessed are those. What? It means to be superlatively happy. You have to ask yourself, are you as happy as humanly possible right now? If you're, if you're not fully content with your life, if you're not totally at peace with God, it, it's because you're not giving God your whole heart. And the call for all of us visiting, even those in the church, make the decision tonight that you're going to make a decision to hold to the truth. You're not going to get caught up in the lies of the world because the lies of the religious world that say, be a good person, go to church, have led to the highest use of antidepressants today, the highest use of anti-anxiety medication, the highest use of divorce, drug abuse, drug use, sex trafficking, child pornography, the, the, the sickness we see in the world is due not, not to just those who are, who are, who are, who are satanic, who are those who, who hate religion, who hate God. It, it, it's those who are sitting in a church pew, but aren't willing to give their whole heart, who, who, who want to who play the line, who, who have muddied the waters so that those who are outside don't know what it really means to follow God. Don't really see the, tr the, the, the full truth because it, it, it's people unwilling to make the Bible their standard. But the call for us tonight is let's be those people who read this and see this is the truth of the universe. I'm not going to be the reason that somebody becomes an atheist because so many people see the Christian world. They say, what's the number one word you think of when you think of Christians? Do you think of hypocrisy? We're, we're, we're not those people. We're those who are, who are going to follow the example of Jesus Christ, who Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the greatest military generals of all time, said this about, said this of Jesus Christ. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone 
founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men will die for him. In every other existence but that of Christ, how many imperfections? From the first day, first day to the last, he is the same, majestic and simple, infinitely firm and infinitely gentle. He proposes to our faith a series of mysteries and commands with authority that we should believe them, giving no other reason than those tremendous words, I am God. The Bible contains a complete series of acts and of historical men to explain time and eternity, such as no other religion has to offer. If it is not the true religion, one is very excusable in being deceived, for everything in it is grand and worthy of God. The more I consider the gospel, the more I am assured that there is nothing there which is not beyond the march of events and above the human mind. Even the impious themselves have never dared to deny the sublimity of the gospel, which inspires them with a sort of compulsory veneration. What happiness that book procures for those who believe it. And here Napoleon, one of the greatest military generals, says, you know, there's no greater kingdom. There's no greater power than the power of Jesus Christ with all firmness and all gentleness. But the call for us, he says, what happiness that book procures for those who believe it. My, my call to us is a step further to not just believe it, but to put it into practice. When, when we make the Bible our standard, we, we say, hey, the Bible is going to be more than just a book to me. I'm going to seek after God. I'm going to hold to the standard of God's word. And, and if you're not convinced yet, I want to call you to get into a Bible study. See what, what fires up everybody on this call. Why so everybody's so happy, so encouraging. See the spirit that's living within us. I would, the, the call is to get into a Bible study and not make society your standard, but make God's word your standard and, God, and allow God to do incredible things, not just in your life but to use your life to impact many others as the call of Jesus Christ was 2,000 years ago and as the call of Jesus Christ is today. Thank you, guys. I love you. Have a great Have night. A great Let's go. Let's go, Christian.